which of these Locke is referring to. It's discussing. Uh, I'm inclined to think that the, um, the greatest likelihood is that he is referring to um, the Cambridge Platonists. Uh, the Cambridge Platonists. Now, a brief word there. Um, there was in the Italian Renaissance, in the 14th, 15th century, 15th century particularly, the Italian Renaissance, a revival of Platonic philosophy. Platonism having been largely eclipsed by the Aristotelian influence for a number of years. Particularly in the um, Florentine Academy in Florence. Uh, you get a man with the name of Ficino uh, who um, gets cited in all of the discussions, the principal influence coming out of the Italian Renaissance on the English Renaissance. Where in England you have um, somebody like uh, John Collette in the 15th century who applied Platonism to religion and education and others like Thomas More and Spencer applied it to politics. So you get a whole platonic uh, revival in the Renaissance. Now, Cambridge Platonism was the 17th century successor of that Renaissance revival. Uh, the principal figure in it, a man by the name of Richard Cudworth, who died in 1688, and as you see from that, was therefore a younger contemporary of John Locke. It was a movement primarily among Anglicans in opposition to two other kinds of alternatives which they very much disliked. One was the mechanistic view of nature, including human nature, in Thomas Hobbes. And even for that matter in um, Descartes' view of the physical world. Mechanistic science generally, they were opposed to. And you'd expect that of a Platonist who, um, as an idealist, and this was uh, Platonism with theory of emanations, therefore more neoplatonic in some regards, it was an idealist metaphysic which rejected the view that matter is real and has real causal powers, therefore rejected the view that causal stimuli to the senses can produce ideas, therefore reverted to the theory of innate ideas in opposition to materialism and thence to, um, to Hobbes. Also um, reacting against the Calvinism of the Puritans which they thought um, belittled human nature and just bred sectarian religious disputes. What they were saying, rather, is that by virtue of innate ideas, reason has power, you see the rule of reason still, reason has power to know the existence of God to know our moral responsibilities, the essence of Christianity is a moral life and the contemplation of God, rather than all sorts of quibbles about theological orthodoxy. And uh, for that, they found Cambridge Platonism amply sufficient. Innate knowledge, innate moral knowledge, the Platonic ideal is a contemplative love of the good, which is God, you see. Now, it's in response to that 
I'm suggesting that John Locke, coming out of his Puritan background, argues against there being any innate ideas. Okay? No, our time has gone. Has it? No, it hasn't. I'm still trying to get adjusted. No, we've got another ten minutes. Great. Um, the John Locke argues against innate ideas. Okay, now how does he argue? Well, you'll find um, a whole array of different lines of thought woven into the material. Basically, his point is this. If knowledge is innate, if ideas are innate, uh, they would be known universally. But, modus tollens, there are no universal ideas. Therefore, conclusion, ideas are not innate. Now, he doesn't spell it out in exactly that form. That's my logical construction of his argument. If ideas are going to be innate, they'll be universal. There's no universal consensus about such ideas. Therefore, they're not innate. Oh, and he goes one step further, even if they were universal, that wouldn't prove they're innate. It would be a non sequitur to think it is. Because you could explain universality by other means. Common empirical factors, for instance. Well, what does he do to justify the claim that um, there are no universal ideas. Well, uh, to begin with, um, the ideas that are supposed to be innate, ideas of God and moral ideas, are unknown to children and idiots. To children and idiots. Those, in other words, without the mental development to be able to think those ideas. Uh, and, you know, he works with the, um, the question, what does it mean for an idea to be innate? You mean it must be in the understanding. But how can it be in the understanding if it's not understood? Can something be in the understanding which somebody doesn't understand? For something to be in the understanding is to be understood, isn't it? And uh, young children particularly simply don't understand. Um, that's one line of thought. Um, a second is to um, point up cultural diversity. Remember the age of discovery, 16th century? Uh, cultural diversity is evident in ethics, in regards to ideas of God. So how can we claim, if there are no universal ideas there, that these crucial ideas, for the Cambridge Platonists at least, are innate? Okay. Now, at the same time, having said that, there's um, a passage on uh, page 168 where he accounts for the idea of God um, with all of its obscurity and diversity in ways that his um, Puritan background had taught him. So um, he says at the very top of 168 um, that there is, let's see, such an idea is deducible from every part of knowledge, an idea of God, for the visible marks of extraordinary wisdom and power appear so plainly in all the work of the creation that a rational creature who will but seriously reflect on them cannot miss the discovery of a deity. That's simply a paraphrase of Romans 1. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. Uh, so it's simply a paraphrase of Romans 1. But no innate ideas. Uh, John Calvin, you may be aware, in his Institutes of the Christian Religion, uh, says that um, in, in all uh, people uh, there is a, um, some sense of a deity, some sensus deitatis, vague, 
undefined, and it's that which is the seed of religion, the semen religionis. Um, so that it looks to me like this is what John Locke is referring to at this juncture, this sense of a deity that arises simply from reflection on the things that are made. Well then, uh, no innate ideas, so how is he going to explain uh, the origin of ideas with reference to the senses? Well, um, what he does is to offer a whole uh, list of um, suggestions in spelling this out, and I uh, will note them, and you can um, check them out in your reading by next time. Uh, first of all is the claim that the consciousness, the human mind, birth, is a blank tablet, like a blank piece of paper, tabula rasa. Uh, like a blank piece of paper on which experience leaves marks. Now that notion of tabula rasa you find as early as some of the Stoics, certainly in Aristotle, so that it's part of the growing empiricist tradition. Second, um, something I've already um, pointed out, an idea is at best a mental representation His is a representational theory of knowledge. Our ideas are representations of properties and things external. Um, then um, he distinguishes between simple and complex ideas. A simple idea would have to do with one property at a time. Complex conjoining a number of simple ideas. So as you look at me, you see a blue shirt. Well, the idea of blue is a simple idea. Blue, shirt-like, would be a complex idea. And by the time you get the whole of me in the picture, it gets far more complex than that. Okay, simple, complex. Um, simple ideas are as I said before, atomistic ideas, indivisible units. Yes, sir. We get ideas um, from both the internal and the external senses. You know about the five external senses. The internal is um, uh, simply reflection on our own mental states. So I can reflect on my own ideas that I have. Reflect on the blueness that I have as an after image in my mind. I can reflect on my own mental acts, like thinking, wishing, believing, the various other kinds of activities that Descartes put into his cogito ego so. So internal and external senses. Um, the characteristic of simple ideas is that they must be clear and distinct. Does that sound familiar? 